I'm so glad to be here tonight with Liz Faircloth from The Real Estate Investor. Liz, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Chelsea. Thanks for having me on. Excited to be back with your community. It's always a pleasure. Oh, we're going to have so much fun. So guys, tonight we're going to be talking about the roadblocks to real estate investing and how to really make sure you succeed and thrive. As always, we'll be watching the chat for the comments. We'll answer questions as they come in, but we'll also leave time for Q&A at the end. So just drop a comment and let us know where you're watching from and are you already invested in real estate or are you just curious about it? It will kind of help us frame what we're going to talk about, the questions, type of questions we're going to ask Liz. But Liz, let's kick us off and tell us a little bit about your experience. What do you do in the real estate world? Sure, sure. So i uh, been investing for about 16 years, uh, started in multifamily, had a lot of twists and turns from flips to new construction to office buildings, and then really got our stride with multifamily from small and we scaled into larger uh, multifamily. So now at this point, we are our syndicators, which means we pull a lot of money together and buy large assets uh, along the East Coast. So our, our projects are in Kentucky. We have buildings in Kentucky, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and we, we still do stuff in New Jersey. I know no one's investing in New Jersey now. <laughs> uh, poor New Jersey, but uh, we got our start there and we're actually doing a development project in Trenton, New Jersey. Oh, that's uh, really cool. Where we got our start uh, in investing. So, but mostly on the larger multifamily side. And if we do development, we're like partnering with people and things like that, which is a whole other which is a whole other ball of wax in this place. So that's the, but yeah, my experiences varies, but that's, that's mostly what I'm involved in now. So how did you decide early on that you really wanted to lean into real estate as a way to build wealth? Yeah. So, you know, it's funny, you know, I was uh, going to school for social work. I wanted, I was getting my master's degree in social work, so I wasn't even dabbling in it. I, I wanted to open my own practice. Uh, I always wanted to help people in that way and just counsel mm -hmm. them and help them. And at the same time, simultaneously, um, my brother-in-law, who is literally the only entrepreneur I knew, handed me Rich Dad, Poor Dad okay. and, uh, by Robert Kiyosaki. And, and the book kind of opened your eyes to um, passive investments. And, and he talks a lot about real estate investing and sales and, and, and what it takes. And it's just... It sounded great reading it. <laughs> you know, obviously, it's a little more different when the rubber meets the road, but it sounded really fascinating from building wealth and not just trading your time for money. Yeah. Which is, you know, how my, at the same time, my now husband at the time, boyfriend, you know, we had both families hardworking, uh, you know, uh, but in terms of like the wealth building or assets working for you, that was a new concept to me, quite honestly. And I was 22. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, that, that was really where that, that idea was kind of, you know, that seed. And mm -hmm. it's interesting because at the same time I did a, um, I took a business course that also made me want to do, you know, I was getting a social work degree. So I actually took a course, I was going to Penn university of Penn. So I'm like, I'm at the, like the school. that's like literally the best, um, business school in like the, the world. Oh maybe. yeah. So, so I'm like, well, I'll take a course. So I took a course at Wharton and I took it on entrepreneurship and I started my business plan was to start a women's organization to help women with mental illness and emotional, uh, you know, things going on for them to help them. So yeah. that's where that idea was also launched with invest her, which is 20 years ago. But anyway, that's where the seed of, um, and then I started learning about it. I was like, real estate's fascinating. It's bricks and mortar. I can go see it. Um, we can make it better, make a community better. And here we are. I love it. And so before we get into the roadblocks, I think we all know that the economy is a little bit uncertain right now. We've got sky high inflation rates. We've got rising interest rates and rising real estate pricing all at the same time. So a lot going on. And so I have a two part question for you. The first being, is this still a good time to get started in real estate? And then if you were starting over, would you still focus on multifamily or is there a different part where there might be more opportunity right now? Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. It's a question we get a lot in our community, right? Because, you know, people's some, somehow during COVID, everyone just had these like blinders on of just like, just, it was a crazy, it's a crazy hot market and off from mm -hmm. offers and it was competitive both on the single family side to large multi, which is where I am. Um, even just to give you an example, our team has been in the business for quite some time. We have broker relationships. We're not a new company, so we have a, an advantage. Yeah. We made 200 offers last year, right? 200. Oh you know, and we under underwrote 200 and, and, and it's like, and, and I think we close on like two buildings. So the pet competition, wait, wait, right? 200 offers to two buildings. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And so competition is just, was, is just been crazy on like for multifamily. And, and so, so here, here's the deal. I, I would say a couple of things that, you know, obviously inflation is going up. So if you're looking to do something, you want to be really mindful of, there's always a good time to buy and there's always motivated buyers regardless of what's going on in the economy. 
So don't get so wrapped up into like the national economy. You have to know what's going on. You have to know what's happening. You have to mm -hmm. also be hyper-focused on your local economy. Because yeah. how, how can I compare where I live in New Hope, Pennsylvania to another community when, when it's, a, it's a, you know, it's hyper-focused. Markets are hyper-focused. Yeah. But when we have something, to, like a, an overall landscape, we have to be mindful of. Mm -hmm. I'm not an economist, but I would say you really want to be conservative in your underwriting. But it is always a good time to buy. I mean, when, the, when there's over, when there's a lot of competition, which it is certainly for small to large multi, um, people overspend, they overpay. And then when the market corrects itself or something happens, that same property that you thought was a great deal ends up not, ends up not being so good because you overpaid for it. Yeah. So, you know, it, so be informed, know what's going on. But if the numbers work and you're conservative in your underwriting, whether it's a vacation rental or whether it's a single family home or it's a duplex or whatever you're looking to get into, uh, I always believe it's a good time. People need to live if, as long as you're providing quality, affordable housing in a growing market. Those are two good things. I don't see how you can lose, but you do need to be conservative and you need to make sure your numbers, you're not overpaying, which happens a lot. Or we underestimate expenses when people get into their, their first or second property. Mm -hmm. If I had to do it over again, would I invest in real estate? I don't think so right now because it's so overheated. So how would I get into the game? I'd be competing with people who've been doing this for some time. Yeah. I'd either, I'd either join a current team. I go, people always need deals. They need money. Mm -hmm. How small the property is or how big it is. Those are the two things every property, every um, real estate investing team needs, whether it's a solo team or a big team. So if you can add value to an existing team, I totally would have, do, I would be doing that now. I'd be, how can I add value and maybe get a small part of the equity or a piece and I can learn I'm, and my skin's not in the game. Yeah. Or I would also look at, you know, I always say to people in your local market, look at the markets that are growing. People are going to, they're not leaving, they're going to, number one, really simple. And number two, affordable housing, not the technical affordable housing, there's different, but but literally people can afford to live there. Yeah. Uh, what Then knowing that, what problems can you solve in a, in a local economy? I'm also a very big fan of just like, how can you solve problems? Is it inventory? Well, how can you solve that problem? Yeah. Can you build? I mean, there's always opportunity from that perspective. So start getting like the problem solving hat on versus should I buy this rental or this building or not get involved right now? Mm -hmm. I'd also say commercial space. There's an enormous opportunity to repurpose commercial space right now. Um, I would totally be, I, and I'm not going to start a whole new niche. I got enough businesses going on right now, but I'd be looking at all the dilapidated or commercial buildings that are underutilized companies yeah. are not using anymore and repurpose them into maybe uh, um, either residential or repurpose them into um, short-term leases for commercial, uh, for businesses that want short-term kind of use, kind of like a Regis or something like that. Yeah. The repurposing world is I think huge right now. And just taking an asset that's not doing well and repurposing for solving a local markets problem. So there's a few things I want to unpack here. So there's, there's people listening who are not in the real estate space and they hear, be conservative with your underwriting. And they're like, what does I that have mean? No idea what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Can you give gotcha. us a little more information? Yeah, sure, sure. So, you know, when it comes down to analyzing a property, right? You got income and you got expenses, just like mm -hmm. I'm sure you teach about, uh, you know, financial wherewithal and having your your personal, you know, yeah. expenses and income in, in a good place. Rental properties and real estate uh, projects are no different. It just might have more numbers, might have more zeros, or it might just have more complexity. But in the end, it's really you're assessing income versus expense. So. <clears throat> So often when people, um, you know, they look at a property and they say, I want to buy this vacation rental. There's like the best case scenario. It's going to be rented out, you know, 25 nights this month. I don't know. You know, whatever that best, whatever that yeah. is in that, that market. Or what's the worst case scenario? Being conservative in your under, underwriting is literally analyzing a deal. You can do that on a, on a napkin. You can do that with a fancy software, right? And the more yeah. units some of these buildings are, 100, 200, it gets more complex because there's so many pe moving pieces. But literally looking at a, like a single family home, what are the, what's the income? And there might be other mm -hmm. income. And then what are the expenses? And really um, ensuring that you're conservative on those numbers, meaning it's not like if everything works, yeah. then this project makes sense. Those are the kinds of deals that are more speculative. And those are the types of projects that tend to be like in this in landscape would make me nervous, right? So yeah. for an ex give you a complete example of that, um, we land, we worked on um, a five property portfolio project, our team, and it was uh, close to 700 units, five properties, big, you know, big project. 
Well, we 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 analyzed the income and expenses uh, are under rows, a fancy way of saying it, um, and said, okay, if we are only 60% occupied, mm -hmm. right? So literally 60% of 670 units were occupied. The other 40% are not paying rent. No one's there, you know, what yeah. have you. Our bills would be, we would be at a break even. Okay. That's a good scenario to be in, right? Because God, if we're at 60%, we're doing something really wrong. <laughs> I mean, it gets really bad in, in the world of, of, of large multi. Um, so that's what I mean is really to be conservative and go, okay, phew, this is the worst case scenario. Can we deal with that? Yes. And it could mm -hmm. be a simple thing, like a single family home, all right? Um, or a duplex, you know, and saying uh, what the best case scenario is, worst case scenario. You want to be kind of in the middle somewhere, not just best case. If everything aligns, this can work. That makes me nervous. Sometimes I hear people doing back of the envelope math about like a single family, a first single family rental, which is more common around us. So we live in a college town. And so a lot of it is like single family rentals for students, not building in vacancy almost at all, right? Like if this is how much it is, then 12 months a year. How do we think about vacancy when you're new to this space? Hmm. Now, vacancy depends on like, like long-term versus short-term, right? So I'm mm -hmm. not a short-term I don't have any short-term rentals. So that's a whole different ball of wax of like how many nights do you need covered to, to kind of, you know, I was actually interviewing someone today uh, that does corporate housing. Okay. So it's kind of a mix between long-term and sh uh, short-term, which is an interesting niche. But she said in that niche, it's 80%. Occupancy is what you want. So it depends right. on the niche. Um, I would say single family, when you're fully occupied, obviously it's great. I mean, you have to look at, the tenant that's there and think about like, is it 5%, 10%, uh, you know, vacancy rate, you want to bake something in. I'm, I'm always, even if you have a longstanding tenant and you're buying it off of another investor or what have you, um, five or 10% seems, seems like a good, you want to put something in the underwriting. Yeah. God forbid. Uh, cause single family, if you don't have a tenant, then that goes all your income, right? That's yeah. your, that's your income stream. <laughs> you know? That's it. Um, so yeah, I mean, and then with short term or, or depending on that strategy, right. It varies of what the, um, occupancy is. But like I said, I, this woman was talking about corporate housing, completely different niche. And she said, it's, it's more of the 80% occupancy, which probably makes sense to short term because it's transient. It's coming yeah. and going long-term rentals, in my opinion, are just a little more stable. Because it's just, you know, uh, it's yeah. long term. I don't know how to say it. That's why I've always liked that. But it's also may not be as lucrative as, as other people might tell me their numbers on short term. But that's okay. I like, I like slow and steady. <laughs> slow and steady is fantastic. And so I want to get into these roadblocks. The last question yeah. I want to ask you, though, is you mentioned joining a team, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you're new to this space entirely, how do you even go about that, right? Like if you don't have a lot of experience, why would a team want to bring you on? And I love that question because I feel like we as women undersell ourselves, right? We have so much we bring to the table and it may not even be real estate related. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple of thoughts. I, I would definitely start doing some local networking with like RIA meetings. RIAs are R-E-I-A, very traditional real estate investing networking groups. We've invest her meetups across the country. Yep. These are literally free community building um, circles of women coming together to help each other. Um, but get into conversation with community, like-minded community, that's women or men investing, doesn't matter, whatever works for you, um, and start asking the questions uh, of who you might know who's investing in that market that you're you're starting to learn about. Maybe you see something happening, right? There's some, you know, why is there's a, there's a coffee shop happening in X community that there was never any interest. And it seems like people are really, it's just like a, you know, there's, there's growth yeah. here. We all know that. People know what's happening in the local economy. We don't often think of it from an investing perspective, though. Yeah. My first suggestion is start to get into conversation with people doing investing in that local market or who know people who, who would be there, um, mm -hmm. because then you'll start you'll start to say, hey, can I can I connect what you bring to the table? I always say it comes down to three things. What skills do you do well? There's so many skills you have that are unrelated to real estate. What experience do you have and what personality traits can you bring to the table? Mm. I, at the end of the day, I, I feel like every real estate team, experience, not experience, needs people always to be like local boots on the ground or marketing or sales or growing teams. I mean, I can make a laundry list of things we need on our team, right? Yeah. It's just we, we we have those needs as we grow, just like you see. So I would really like start to own your greatness, own what you do amazingly well. Um, and you're either more of like a task internal person or you're like more of like an outside person. And how you can add value to someone's team just depends on the team and what they need. 
Um, and they always need, they need deals, they need money, but, but they'll be perfectly frank. So if you can add value there somehow, you'll, you know, but beyond that marketing sales, the, the natural skills, but women have a lot to offer and we undersell ourselves. So I always say you should be making a bragging list about yourself and, and you should share it. And if you don't know what you're good at, go talk to people who like and respect you. They'll tell mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Um, and speaking of networking, you're hosting an event in June. Can you tell us a little bit about that before we jump yeah. into the seven roadblocks? Yeah, absolutely. Su super uh, excited about this. We uh, are doing an in-person investor con. So we have 20 um, different speakers coming, five keynotes. Kim Kiyosaki is keynoting. She's going to be talking about how to move beyond the economy and make it more about like what you can control. She's just amazing. Uh, we interviewed her for our podcast and just really just just phenomenal. Um, we have a woman talking about um, she's part of the team who does strategic coach, which is like who, not how and building a team. And she's going to talk about how you could 10x what you're thinking today, maybe thinking bigger. Yeah. Um, and then we have some great women who are real teachers, real experts in, um, you know, how to buy your first rental in, in the first in 90 days. And we have a woman talking about how to renovate and, and really, you know, make the right calls on like the, 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 um, method of buying and then renovating a property. We have a woman talking about self storage. This is a whole other niche in business. That's interesting of people storing their, all their stuff. So we have a bunch of experts in, in breakouts, but beyond all that, what we're excited about is we're going to be putting women together so they can get the support they need and quite honestly transform how they, when they come into that conference and then when they leave, our goal is to transform their life. I know that's a big, tall order, but <laughs> we're literally thinking about everything we could do to make that happen besides like shaking someone. But um, it's going to be a really- Sometimes you need to be shaken though, right? I know. <laughs> we're actually doing a live mastermind where we're going to call a couple of people up and you know, basically help them solve some problem they're dealing with. So this definitely is great for new investors mm -hmm. and also women who are growing their portfolios. It's not- uh, one or the other. So it's just, uh, it's really neat. I mean, a few hundred women, we got about 15 companies come to help be resources. So yeah, it's gonna be really cool. I would love to invite everyone to check it out and join me in Charlotte. <laughs> Absolutely. So guys, that's smartmoneymamas.com forward slash invest con. You can check it out. And through May 7th, you can get 10% off with Mamas 10 uh, for being part of our community. But let's dive into the seven roadblocks yeah. for women in real estate investing and how to overcome them. What's the first roadblock that you see most often? Yeah, so there, there's a lot of things that we get stopped by, and some of them are real, and some of them are real in our heads, I should say. They're all real in our heads, and they're all yeah. real in a sense, right? Of course. But, you know, they, they have different meaning to us. So how do you move through that? And that's what I always talk about, of moving through it so you have that confidence to go. I think confidence is probably one of the biggest, biggest ones. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, Self-awareness, um, goals, and a plan. I'll start with goals and plan, because so often people, Chelsea, will, will say, you know, should I buy a vacation rental? You know, I got a hundred, I got some money set aside or some money I put in a self-directed IRA or, um, you know, or, or I have an inheritance. That's a, that's a common thing, right? I have an inheritance came into, and I want to make some investments and I just don't know which money where I should put this. Yeah. Before, I mean, there's in, in real estate's one asset class, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so before you even jump into the, to, to the how the, the, the lack of just the goals and the plan, I think is like the work that needs to get done in order to figure out what niche and, and markets and, and, and all those sort of things. So for example, like in, you know, in five years, what are your money goals? I'm sure you, you know this cause I'm speaking oh, yeah. the same language here. We just have different, you know, different things. That's why I love, I love work, working together on different things, but what are your money goals, you know, and, and why are you investing in real estate? What yeah. about real estate and what niche? Um, you know, people are like, oh, I'm investing in real estate and I'm flipping property. Yes, in the global sense, but flipping is a beginning, middle and end and you don't have an asset at the end, right? You have, yeah. and, and it does create a, a chunk of money sometimes for people and sometimes you'll hear a horror story. Um, but my point in saying all that is what are your money goals? And maybe that chunk of money is what you need as a down payment for a rental property. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. So you start mm -hmm. to have really good reasons why you're doing what you're doing versus like trends or what other people are doing or wow that's amazing i've always watched ATTV and i love how they flip flip or flop i mean that's not a good reason you know i'm being funny but people yeah. that's sometimes people's reasons mm -hmm. so i always say what are your money goals and is this more of a um is this an add-on to what you're doing or do you like literally looking to replace your income totally yeah. different strategies how Absolutely. aggressive you're going to be um 
what I did in my 20s is different than what I do in my 40s, right? Mm -hmm. How active or passive do you be? Some people don't really want to go smell lumber and deal with a contract. It's like, I don't want to deal with that. Other people are like, oh my God, this is my dream. I love managing projects. I love lumber. I love the smell. Andressa always says, I love the smell of lumber. Um, so you have to kind of know what those goals are. And then you work backwards from there. And you also have to ask yourself, do I want to be, you know, a landlord? You know, and what does that look like? And talk to people who are landlords. Don't talk to Uncle Uncle Joe and Aunt Sally who doesn't own a rental property. Don't ask them. They don't yeah. own rental properties. You got to ask people who have them. And there are great, great stories as landlords. And then there's some that are wacky. And I can tell you the rest of the night, those stories, you know? So yeah. you kind of have to talk to the right people, surround yourself with the right people, but know your goals and why this asset class. Because if you don't like the asset class, and it's always going to be, it's not going to be the right vehicle for you. Um, I really like real estate as an asset class so that, that matters. Yeah. Okay. But like, if you're the, if you're the person who's like, I got interested in this cause I really like HGTV and I've seen the articles of like how the people who've built wealth, most of them own real estate, whatever it is. How do you go from that point to right. having enough knowledge to have goals and a plan? Right. Because you're talking about niches and asset classes and, and timelines. You don't know any of that. Right. At the mm -hmm. beginning. And so where do you gain that knowledge? Yeah. So the knowledge part is to start to get curious. Mm -hmm. Why do you like the HGTV? It's not just obviously building wealth. Let's put that. I mean, that would be something we all want, Lovely. right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> put that on the shelf for now though. So then you say, okay, what is it about this show and what they're doing that really intrigues me? Because mm -hmm. something about it intrigues you. Is it the, is it the interior design? Is it the, 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 you know, renovations? Is it the making something that's dilapidated, beautiful? Is it dealing with clients? There's so many things, right? And and yeah. then you start to just get curious for yourself. So you'll know what you're starting to attract to, um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. That's my my first thought. You know, in terms of the knowledge base, there's, there's a knowledge about the asset class, how you acquire it, how you finance it, and then how you actually implement it. It, mm -hmm. it really comes down to those three things. It doesn't matter which, how big the project, but you want to start to learn. So say short-term rentals is so intriguing to you. Start reading a book. Start, you know, there's books on bigger pockets. Uh, Avery yeah. Carl wrote a great book uh, on, on, on short-term rentals. Um, go to real teachers. Go into these Facebook meetings. Join our Facebook community, whatever works for you. But mm -hmm. start following people that are doing that niche and then start asking questions. As you're finding information out, then you can ask questions and post questions. Don't just be like, is this a good time to uh, buy a vacation rental? No one's going to answer you because yeah. it's like, what, what, where do we begin? Where? With, right? yeah. <laughs> but do a little homework, right? Do a little fact finding. And then you're like, I'm not sure if short, that's a, that's, but it's a bigger question than that the bigger question of, you know, am I looking to what money and assets do I have? And what am I yeah. looking to achieve with that? Um, would 5% make me happy? Do I need 20%? I mean, you know, it comes down to some of those questions you have to ask for yourself. Yeah. I have 25,000 put aside. I have half a million? I don't, I don't know those things. Right. So I think the bigger question is, you know, where do you want to be? And then what's starting to intrigue you? And is that going to get me to where I'm going to go, where I want to go? You don't know that at the beginning, but yeah. just by some curiosity and just starting to take some baby steps of, uh, workshops or a book or, you know, non crazy amounts of money, of course, not crazy coaching programs. If you're not interested, yeah, you start to get intrigued and you'll start to ask the questions. This isn't for me. You know, I don't want to deal with people. I mean, if you don't like people and you don't want to deal with interior design, you might have need a partner to do short-term rentals, right? Because yeah, the concierge, right? That's a guest experience, very mm -hmm. different than other, you know, niches. I know we're skipping ahead to like the yeah. third thing, which is lack of knowledge. But what was the most valuable resource you found when you were just starting to invest? Because you said you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which is a great kind of anecdote, but that is not teaching you how to do of things. Course. And so what was the most valuable resource to getting you started? We got we got started uh, by taking uh, as many courses as we could at the local RIA meeting. It was DIG, Diversified mm -hmm. Investor Network or Group. They're still in existence, actually. I'm totally butchering. They they were great. And every weekend, my husband and I lived an hour and a half away. We were dating. This is what we did on the weekends: was go to real estate <laughs> investing courses. And these were like old school. We got binders. You know, I'm dating myself. But this is 2004. We started yep. going. They like the binders. There's no like you know apps or anything. I was like, here's your here's your binder for a hundred dollars. We just started to learn, and we'd hear something, 
And we're like, let's try that. And I think that's the big thing, Chelsea, that stops people is they think they need to know, they need to do a dissertation before they can get going. Yes. And, and you're just not going to get started. You're just not. I mean, point blank. And what's fascinating with women, and I know you know this research, but you know, it women continually outperform, right? Statistically, mm -hmm. men. What yet what stops us, right, is we think the lack of knowledge or the confidence. But if we start to do something, even in a small way, take micro steps, take mm -hmm. one tip that you got from that one book, and then start to do it or start to talk to someone, and it just feels like momentum. So yeah. we had um taken courses every weekend. And one gentleman told us to um, call for rent ads. He said, open the newspaper, call for rent ads. We're like, why would we do that? And he <laughs> said, because when you call for rent ads for like a duplex, that means half their property is vacant and they might be motivated to sell. We're like, that's not going to work, you know, because we're like from New Jersey. I'm like, nothing works. But I'm um, skeptical. <laughs> but I tried it and we went door knocking. You know, we had time on our hands because we were in our 20s, no kids, you know, yep. <laughs> nothing else to do than door knock. And one gentleman, uh, if we, no one really liked us with door knocking, but we called one gentleman that was a, a foreign ad. And that's how we found our first property. Because we mm -hmm. took one thing we learned at one workshop, tried it, and that moved us forward. Did we know everything about running a duplex? No. Not at all, but we yeah. started to learn. I'd say also, there's some great, um, you know, there's some great, great resources um, on like just, you know, owning your first rental property and what you need mm -hmm. to be, you know, what, I forget the guy's name. Uh, it was like landlording tips. I don't even know if he's still around, Don Beck, but he wrote a big course on landlording and we just learned everything we could because we were like hands on landlords. Mm -hmm. um, so you just start to learn, take baby steps. But but the local RIA meeting, RIA group was our, our entry to just education. And we educate ourselves for a year. Mm -hmm. We educate ourselves for a year. We didn't buy a property in a whole year. And we took courses every single week. We still didn't think we knew anything. And quite honestly, I don't think we did until we really got that first property, you know, and we're still learning. I think that's part of entrepreneurship and real estate, invest, all these things, right? There's so much unknown. You can't have the perfect plan. It's not going to work. And that actually leads me to my next question, which is, Women often want the whole plan, right? They want the vision even before they start the conversation. So when you're saying like, go ask somebody questions, go to these meetings, women are nervous to even walk into that room. So how can they position themselves differently so that they're ready to, to network and ask these questions and talk to other experts without feeling like they're wasting their time or something? That's why I, you know, I always make the joke that, you know, when we go, to, when women go places together, like they go to the bathroom together, right? Yeah. I mean, I, me and my friends, I'm like, you want to go to the bathroom? Yeah, great. We'll go together. Like <laughs> men don't go to the bathroom together, right? They're like, hey, buddy, you want to go? To no one, they don't do that. Some reason there's a communal naturalness to women, right? We yeah. have this communal feeling. Um, I don't know, you know, and not everyone has that, but I see a lot of women wanting to do stuff together. So yeah. I think that's why, you know, your community is so, so vital, right? It's mm -hmm. like learning about money and talking about money and good money habits together. It's the same thing we're doing on the, on the real estate investing side. So that's why these small meetups, right? Well, I mean, I spoke, I said hello to one over here in my neighborhood, uh, about a half hour away. I couldn't make it tonight because I was with you and, um, it's like 12 women together. So these are non-intimidating environments where you could just go and, offer support and get question answered and, and not feel like, and everyone's new at something, but yeah. everyone has something to offer. So I think just taking those little baby steps to maybe non-intimidating environments would, is a good, is a good first step. Yep. Um, and there's women that want that too. So it's just finding, you know, that's where we do like accountability groups, you know, just women getting together and connecting. Absolutely. So um, I think that's the key is finding non-intimidating, smaller, women really appreciate the smallness of the groups versus like a hundred people. Now yeah, our yeah. conference will be more, right? Cause that's, it's a different, different game, but our meetups are small groups. Yeah. You know, right. I, and I like that because women really are like buddies after they're in a circle. They're like helping each other, you know, which is fantastic. So you have those local meetups, you've got the bigger pockets forums, which are great. Right. Yeah. Um, which is Absolutely. online. And then you guys have a membership as well, right? We do. We do. We have. Um, so after like a year and a half of, of talking to women, they're like, you do coaching? Do you do this? We're like, oh, I don't know if I want to do one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, <laughs> but no, uh, we uh, we really looked at what women needed and wanted and said, Let, what can we put together? And we put together like a, a membership. So it's high accountability and high, um, high accountability, high mentorship, and also high kind of like 
small uh, pods, we call them. So there's a pod yeah. on short-term rentals where they learn, Avery Call is one of our pod vendors. So she teaches about short-term rentals. We have another woman talking about small multifamily. Mm -hmm. We have another woman who talks about um, syndication and how to scale into maybe larger stuff with a team. So they teach one call a month, one call a month and second calls accountability. So it's, we do masterminding with them, me and Andressa, we do like accountability calls and coaching calls group coaching, but it's all group oriented. Um, awesome. And then, you know, so it's really just this close knit group. We had a woman who the day of her closing almost lost the deal and she got the lender from our community. And then one of the women in our community knew the lender, the owner called yeah. him, said, this is what's going on. She's about to lose this project because you're dragging your feet and the <laughs> seller is now PO'd and they're going to yeah. cut the deal. So the owner gets involved and you saw this all happening on Facebook because she's like, I don't know what to do. I don't want to lose my first property as a fourplex Cincinnati. He steps in and do -do -do -do, and, and, and it worked out and she closed. That's and I'm awesome. like, I was just felt so good about that. I'm like, it's because of the network, right? It, it's because yeah. you so it, it's like lonely if you don't like, who do you call? What do you do? Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, that's what we have. It, it's a Strive membership. We open the doors once a year and uh, we're gonna be opening in, in June and July. It's a, a yearly, a yearly like mastermind mentorship program. I love it. So third point, and we have a question here from Andrea Carter, which brings us right into this third point fantastically, which is as a new investor, what do you re recommend to acquire funding? And so I think lack of money is the third thing we we're going to talk about. So how do we handle that if we want to get into real estate investing? Sure. So a couple of things. You know, we got our start by borrowing money, you know, borrowing my, taking a loan from, from my father and my dad's, a, you know, my, my dad's a school, was a school teacher, he's retired and my mom worked part-time. So him lending us 30,000 was a big deal. It wasn't like he oh, yeah. was, this, you know, corporate guy who had just, yeah, 30,000, whatever. It was a big deal. And then he lent it to us, newbie, newbie investor one and two, you know, thank God everything worked out. We, we, he, I think he charges 5% interest. It was great. Um, but but regardless, we've got our start by by working with friends and family and saying, hey, this is what we're doing. And it was it was a strong plan. And he he mm -hmm. trusted us enough and trusted us. Um, I think that's always a place to start. That can be very scary for people, obviously, especially when you don't know anything. The last thing you want to do is like lose your father's money. I mean, and I'm not <laughs> suggesting that to anyone. Um, but I'm just telling you how I got my start. Yeah. I, I think the 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 big thing though. Um, when you start to get, you know, okay, so do I have money to invest? And I always say investable income is money that you could lose. That's mm -hmm. really to me, not that you want to lose it, who wants to lose money. But in other words, we work with passive investors, we work with people who don't want to operate, they just want to, you know, uh, invest along with you. Yeah. And they'll say, listen, I got, I got, I got 50,000. And they're like, that's, that's the minimum. That's fine. They're like, this is literally my last 50,000. We're like, do not invest it with us. So that, that go, please, please add more to that. You know, you mm -hmm. don't want to ever be. So my point, my first point is, do you have access to any money now? And if you don't, wh where could you potentially creatively get access to money? A couple mm -hmm. of thoughts. One, a lot of people don't realize that they have their 401k and they may have worked at X company. They've changed companies and they may have money in their 401k that they can be, um, they could be, uh, you know, utilizing or, or transferring into a, what's called a self-directed IRA. Yep. There's a lot of rules around that. I'm not, so there's rules that you can't actually use your self-directed IRA directly in your own projects. You yep. can though passively invest with uh, a multifamily operator. And there's a lot of things you can do with that. So that's just one thought. And when you passively, meaning you're literally alongside someone operating a building, that might be a way to get started. So you're making a better percentage and you start to learn some of the skills that you want to build your wealth. So that's just one thought for, but you, the other thought is a HELOC, a home equity line of credit. Other people don't realize that they're sitting on tons of equity in your home. Uh, and, and so what I mean by that is what you owe and what, you know, what you own the property today and what the property is worth. There's so much room that, you know, th there's money to be able to be used in your own home. We, um, we bought a bank foreclosure, our personal residence I'm sitting in right now. Um, we bought a bank foreclosure uh, for four hundred thousand a couple of years ago. It's mm -hmm. worth it's worth now six hundred and fifty thousand, right? Mm -hmm. I'm getting just real numbers. And so I think at the time of our HELOC, we owed three fifty. So we were able to percentage wise, depending on the bank where they're at, yeah, 80 percent. We were able to pull out a hundred thousand dollars. So we are using that hundred thousand in real estate investing. Now mm -hmm. we feel comfortable doing that. Um, but if you're betting on yourself and you need seed money, 
you're just borrowing against your your own home. Yeah. So those are just two quick creative ways. I'll also say, uh, look into um, seller financing. Mm -hmm. Seller financing is literally where the seller is financing the property for you, meaning they're the bank. So it's not yeah. the mortgage, but owner, owner, Mr. Seller, or Mrs. Seller holds the note, if you will, and they're getting paid the monthly, not mm -hmm. the bank. And it's a way that usually people can buy a property. You're still buying it, but very little money out of your own pocket. I know a lot of women, a successful women who built great portfolios um, have, have done that for years. And it's, again, something you need to learn a little more about what, what the ramifications are, of course, but it's very mm -hmm. legal. You know, uh, It's called seller financing. Yeah. Um, the other point I'll say is you could partner with someone, a friend or a family member who has the funds to invest and you're going to do it collaboratively. You're going to have one role. They're going to have another role and you're both active partners together. Again, there's a lot of pieces around that, but as long as you're active and you go and buy a property together and you both have, bring something to the table, you can be, you can have a role. doesn't mean money. They can have a role. Maybe they're the down payment. So mm -hmm. there's creative ways. Um, just a few. So getting involved financially with family and friends can be a complicated thing. So what are some things you should think about before you form a partnership like that? Treat your family or friend as you would a stranger. Not treat them to, you know, obviously you can still give them a hug if they're, you know, <laughs> you're going to give them a hug and not that you give a hug to everyone, but you want to put the correct paperwork and the right legal structure in place as though they are a stranger. Yeah. Um, we, my father, even though we were a bit naive in our twenties, we did, we had a, we had it all in writing. We did a private loan mm -hmm. and private loans need a promissory note and they need a mortgage security document or, or a deed of trust, right? Not yep. to get too complicated, but they need certain documents to protect and have collateral. God forbid something happens, you know? Um, we had those documents in place and that was 16 years ago. So mm -hmm. um, you need to have honest conversations and all those things are usually written up. What happens, especially if you're literally going to equity, you're joining together in an LLC or a partnership, right? Yeah. Um, you have to have it all laid out. Do not Google. I had a woman in our membership say, oh, I got some templates. Can I just use the templates? No, don't use a template. This is like big deal. Like you got to spend money to make sure this is right. So, cause things always happen. I, mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many things happen. There was a property that we renovated in Trenton and, uh, the contractor ended up stealing a whole lot of money from us. Like a lot of money. It was a big mixed use reno, 4,000 square foot house. Uh, it was just a big property, it had commercial mm -hmm. on the first floor, like three or four units. It was just a, it was just a mess. And it took like four years. It just was, a, I can't say anything else besides it was a mess. Yeah. And yeah. we ended up having owed, now my father's invested with us along the way. And we always, you know, everything's always worked out. Uh, he had 75,000 in this property. And um, when we refinanced, we couldn't pay him back the full amount. So we had a, we had an agreement you know, that we were going to pay that back as, you know, in, in, in this amount of time and, and yeah. through different refinances and different things that got complete. But we treated that as though that was another investor we didn't, weren't related to, same thing. And we made him whole and he paid all of his interest that mm -hmm. he was owed. Not like, Absolutely. oh, I'll pay you what I can. No, we wouldn't do that to him. Like, no. you wouldn't do that to a stranger. <laughs> you're not going to do that to your father. Or, you yeah. know, so I think as long as you go into it with open eyes, honest conversations and, and with the right, like legal documents, no handshake. No, don't do that. I, I, I'm not a fan of that. I, I've, I don't think that's the right way to approach it. Even if you want to lease to a friend and you don't want to have a, um, uh, I'm sorry, if you want to rent to a friend and you don't want to have a lease, not a good idea. Seen that blow up for people. I don't care mm -hmm. if they're your friend or your sister or your mother have a lease. Yeah. Absolutely. Because that's what you do to a stranger. So that's my big suggestion there. It just protects everybody and it makes absolutely. everything clear. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. All so right. we've talked about three. We've three. talked about lack of goals and plan, lack of knowledge and lack of money. What's the fourth roadblock we need to think about? Yeah, we haven't talked about um, the the self, the self self-awareness one. Mm. And, and I think that's a really big one in this business. Uh, it's important in any business, but I think really doing some you know, soul searching and saying like, what do I bring to the table? You know, what mm -hmm. greatness do I have? Yeah. I may not have 16 years of real estate investing experience, but what do I know? You know, if you're a mom, you know, a shit ton. <laughs> like just that in and of itself, you are a mother, you like can handle a whole lot, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? And I, I, I feel like we just, 
I think the self-awareness, having the self-awareness, being crystal clear of your greatness, and then owning it mm -hmm. is really important because you don't want to like get into a project with someone. And I see this happen and they get into a project. Oh, well, you know, oh, I'll take 10% and they take like the, the scraps that people want to throw them. When they brought the deal to the table, they did the legwork and they just mm -hmm. totally cut themselves and their worth down. And that totally bothers me. Yeah. When it, and if it was the tables were turned as a guy, and for, they wouldn't do that. They would protect their, their worth. Mm -hmm. So self-awareness begins with doing some soul searching of your skills, your experience, what you love, and you, you know, what your passions are. Um, and then really getting a sense of what, what greatness you bring to the table. And also just doing an audit, like a personal audit. Where are you with your money? What are your personal finances? Like, you know, you got to know those important things. Uh, investment is an additional. It's a, it's a, it, it's a, it's a um, way to build wealth. But it, it, if you don't have strong money management and you're having a strong audit of where you are today, how are you going to know if you're doing well, right? It's like, it, it, you know, so you know these things with, with the work you do and you stand for. So taking an audit, taking like an exploratory look at, you know, yourself. And also I'm a big fan of, of like, where are you in your own emotional and um, emotional growth? And, and as, a, as an entrepreneur, as a leader, have you, um, you know, what, what's working for you? What's not, you know, uh, mm -hmm. we all have gaps and we all have strengths. And if you don't know what those are, it's hard to like work with other people because you're not going to be so aware of your own stuff. Um, yeah. Personally, I, you know, I have been uber self-aware, but it's hard to be self-aware and then not be stubborn or, you know, as, as I've grown as a leader, I, you know, I'm like, ah, I know all this stuff. I'm self-aware. And then, and then you do something and you're like, wow, you know, what was, what was going on for me? So I've done a lot of work. I, I have a coach. Like I do a lot of work on myself and my own being present and just name the list. I mean, I have a laundry list of things I'm working on. So mm -hmm. I think that's important just for anyone, but I think it's certainly important if you're trying to do something additional to your world and say, how do I build wealth and raise a family? It's like, woo, a lot. Yeah. So it's like taking baby steps and really knowing your worth and what you enjoy and what you don't enjoy is really important um, because it takes energy and effort just like anything. So, yeah. Okay. And then you touched on raising a family. Maybe you still have a, a nine to five while you're getting yeah. started. How do we manage all this? Like is the because I think this is the next one, right? Which is lack of time. I know, I know. I wish I had a complete answer for you, but I have not mastered it now. <laughs> you know, it, it's a work in progress. I, I think time's interesting, right? I think I, I I'll say something about this because I, I just was talking with someone. Um, she's getting married this weekend, mm -hmm. and she I saw how you doing, you know, because you know, week before your wedding, and she's like, I'm completely overwhelmed. She's like, I'm holding down my W two. I have my two rental properties. I got my I got my new husband who wants to spend time with me. God forbid, you know, your new husband. How dare he? <laughs> and just, so she was just overwhelmed. Yeah. And she goes, I just don't. I just can't wait till it's over. And I stopped her. I was like, I get that. I get where you're coming from. I know it's oh, overwhelming. Yeah. I said, I said, what if you instead thought about enjoying this process? You know, um, this is going to go by really fast. I could tell you 16 years later being married, your day of your wedding goes by like this. I said, why don't you enjoy this time? Don't just like endure it. So my, my point in saying that is I think so often with the overwhelm, we all are, could be in at times. We just endure stuff. We endure it. We get it done. We endure it. We get it done. Women are like amazing at getting shit done. Mm -hmm. But are we enjoying it? Are we enduring it? I don't know about that because there's some days that I literally am just like, you know, <laughs> so I guess the time piece is what is most important to you? And if mm -hmm. building wealth through real estate or through another vehicle is important to you, how can you create some time for yourself to start exploring? But then you start to say like the who, not how do you have to do it all yourself? No. Um, what would that look like? I mean, real estate is a beautiful example of partnerships. It's just from money, from time, from a lot of things. You'll see people always kind of coming together and doing something together. That's also yeah. scarier because it is like a marriage, quite honestly. Yeah. Um, but I, I'll just say that we make time for what we want. We often have more time than we think. And um, we may be giving too much time to things that don't serve us. And mm -hmm. we kind of have to like audit our time. 
So if you're totally overwhelmed, is there a way you can take a step back in a week and just look at the time you're spending? Mm -hmm. And if that means you have to get up a little earlier or stay up a little later, think about your why. Think about why you'd be doing this so you can support the next generation or start a nonprofit or give to other people. That's why women invest in real estate. It's not just like buy a Ferrari. I mean, if you want to buy a Ferrari, awesome. But that's okay. not what motivates a lot of women. It doesn't motivate me. No. Um, I want to help a lot of people. You know, mm -hmm. and yeah, I want to take trips to where I want to go when I want to go on them. But beyond that, like really nice clothes, I, I can do it. I don't even know the designer stuff. I honestly, can, <laughs> friends are like, do you do it? I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't buy designer stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm cheap. But so anyway, so those are some some thoughts there. I am a big fan of the like one week or two weeks of just tracking your time download uh, something like toggle which is free and just keep track of where's your time going because i agree with you that we tend to have more time than we think um but also we have a tendency to be like well when things calm down then i'll do this we're also seeing an example right here of um liz trying to balance motherhood and, <laughs> and business. I, i'm on mute because my daughter's literally screaming at the top of her lungs um do you need to go check on that you want to handle a couple of questions and i'll jump right back in sure go ahead all right, mamas. So we're going to let Liz take a little break here. Motherhood, uh, we are all in this together, right? And so if you have questions for Liz, we're going to move into Q&A pretty soon. Um, but like I was saying, I'm a big fan of the time audit. Take a week, take two weeks if you can do it. And download the Toggle app and just keep track of where your time goes. Because we do have a tendency um, to say, well, when things get quieter, when my kid goes to kindergarten, when my kid goes to high school, when XYZ happens, when things calm down, then I will jump into the things that I'm really interested in, whether that's real estate investing, whether that's a side hustle or something else. Um, life doesn't really slow down, though. It's not really a thing that we toggle um that we get to do. Life will stay as busy as we expect it to stay. And so um, we really need to make sure that there's no perfect time. We have to find the time in, in where we are. And so somebody said the app for managing your time is Toggle. Uh, T-O-G-G-L is a time tr free time tracking app that we use. Uh, it's actually what we use to track time at Smart Money Mamas. And it's what I've used to do time audits in the past. And I'll just say too, I think the, 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 the other part of real estate investing that doesn't get talked about enough is really how active or passive you want to be. Because there's yeah. literally two roads, right? Active means I'm going to go find the property. I'm going to hire the contractor. I'm going to find tenants or someone else, right? The who, yeah. not how. I'm not saying you would do all that. But there's a level of like you're in the driver's seat. And yeah. that yields a certain return, certainly. There's another road that many people don't even think about is that you're a passive investor. Meaning just like we invest in other assets, stock market, et cetera, you can passively invest, right, with people and, and, yeah. and teams. Um, that could look like you're lending money or you're partnering on the act, like a partnership type of agreement. Mm -hmm. So my point in saying that is, as you look at your own time, you might be at a point where, quite honestly, you don't have the time to be that active investor. You might mm -hmm. have some money put aside, and you're like, you know what, 7%, 8%, or even on the upside, 20%, that seems pretty good to me, you know, based yeah. on your time and your goals. So, so often people get into the active and think they have to be a landlord to make money in real estate, not necessarily depending on your goals and lifestyle. So just mm -hmm. remember that active and passive are the kind of two lingo, if you will, that are in our world. Even mm -hmm. if you just passive investing in real estate, you know, I can give you some, some uh, books to look into, but it's very interesting. And it's in a whole nother thought process. It might get you to your goals and you don't have to do it all yourself. Just another mm -hmm. thought. And you now have a, a team, right? So where do you fall in that active versus passive? How much of your time is actually managing the assets that you have or finding new deals? Yeah. So as a team, you know, and I've, I've worn so many different hats with my husband over the 16 years, full-time, part-time, we were running it together. A lot of my time is with my daughter, you know, who's five. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm the, our, our mission is to empower women to live a financially free and balanced life. So I'm really working on the balance. Um, <laughs> and professionally is really working within Invest Her and building up that community. Um, in terms of our investments and our active side is that we are actively, we're almost like the ones driving the multifamily projects. But our team, we have someone who looks for the deals. We have somebody who manages the deals. Um, my husband's role, and I also help in some ways with this, but is you know the the partnerships with 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 people, right? The the mm -hmm. um, the money side of it. So over time, that was what our focus was. My particular role now, I'm not in the day to day running of our assets. I know what's going on. I have like monthly meetings with with Matt to kind of get, and I help with the team 
um, I went down there recently and gave him some ideas. So kind of like a strategic voice, if you mm -hmm. will. Not, I'm not making day-to-day -day decisions, though. We very clear that that's his role. Um, I was doing that, and I've stepped out of that to focus. But um, the passive side, so as we have a win or we sell a property, um, I'm, I'm leading our passive investments. So literally ones that we are not running anymore. So we're really toggling where we're super active. We're trying to do more. Okay. If we have a win or we refinance or we have a HELOC, how yeah. can we maximize that? And I'm leading those, that charge, if you will. Um, and, and, you know, with other people even just to, from, to diversify. So, or even diversify outside of, of, of real estate, you know, or mm -hmm. what have you. So that's been my kind of charge. Um, as like the, the leader of like the family household income or an expenses kind of thing. That's what I lead and do. And passive investments go underneath that. The, the active side are like, which, which market should we get into? Should we buy this building? I don't make those decisions. I, I kind of weigh in because I have to tell, I have to give my opinion about everything, but um, I don't necessarily make the decision because that's not my role. And that's mm -hmm. important to know your role. So. I'm just curious too, at what point in this journey did you and Matt make this your full-time gig? You know, there's so many, there's so many great people in our community, Chelsea, that, that have these strategic plans on how to like leave their job. Right. Yeah. They're making this amount of income and, and it just, it works out that way. Like they're really, they do it the right way. They so build a bridge. <laughs> right. They build the bridge. My husband and I didn't build any bridge. You know, we were just like, let's just do this. So um, I don't know if I can suggest this to anyone. We're, we're a little younger in our twenties. So you kind of do stuff that doesn't make sense in your forties, but, but anyway, um, when we started, we um, we did make some good decisions. I shouldn't beat ourselves up, but we um, when we got started, we had about um, two properties, two or three properties. By no means was not that paying a, a yeah. enough of like a, of, a, of an income for us. But at the same time, we got married, and we financially looked at where we we're going to live, and we also looked at. Uh, my new job, which I ended up not working in social work. I ended up getting a sales position and it was consulting. And so we looked at, okay, if, if she's the only one bringing in income, can we handle all of our expenses? If literally we make zero dollars with real estate. Yeah. And the answer was yes. So we made that leap where he quit his job within the same month of us getting married. He quit oh his my job. Gosh. I know, right? Um, and he hated it. He hated his job. I actually really liked what I did. Um, and, and so I, I continued on and it took a long time, um, to, to build enough assets. We'd have a win here and then a loss there. And it was really, it was tough for many years, mm -hmm. um, until we got really focused on multifamily. Uh, and, and then I left my, I, I left my job 2013 to have my son, you know, 2010 to 2013 is where we got into a stride of, okay, we're bringing in, we're bringing in income here where I took then a step back from my yeah. consulting work. So it took us a long time. Um, we did it, you know, the way we did it, you know, what can I say? You know, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I'd suggest that to everyone. We took a more approach of what's the worst that can happen, you know? Um, but so I think this is such a good lesson though, because real estate, especially when you're watching HGTV can get positioned sometimes in my opinion, as this get rich quick scheme right oh, yeah. of like buy a house with no money yeah. down and all these kind of things you went from 2004 to 2013 before you said guys that you really hit your stride from 2010 to 2013 was what you just said so like that is years of work and difficult times and learning before a you crash. Got... Oh, <laughs> market crash. Market, market yeah. crash oh god that yeah didn't help <laughs> uh, didn't help anybody um that's a lot right and so that touches on, I want to move on to number six and we're going to have some questions in the comments here, but fear of failure. I think what I've seen with people is they get in real estate, they have a difficult time, like a bad flip or something yeah. that doesn't. And then they're like, this isn't for me. And they just leave. How do you, or they don't even start, right? Because they've heard some horror story or read yeah, some article and they're, sure. how do you get over that fear? Yeah. You know, and the fear is real, right? And so I feel like anytime we stretch ourselves and we get into something new, especially when money is involved, right? <laughs> um, you know, and obviously you talk, you you beautifully talk about, you know, knowing your money, you know, blueprint and what your relationship is to money. And I've learned so much about that over over the years. And my husband's more of a spender and I'm a saver and that still comes up for us. And, yeah. you know, but regardless, the fear of failure is real. I think, you know, we have failed. Like we've gotten like hundreds of thousands of dollars stolen from us. We've gotten sued. We've lost deals. I mean, and we've had wins, right? I don't yeah. mean to dismiss that and really great, got into a really great stride in buying small 
to large multifamily and have done well with that and support our family now, right? And in, in, in just just that. So my point in saying all that is that the fear of failure is real for everyone. It happens to you, it happens to me. So it's not like something that you graduate and then you never feel again. I think the key though is to get curious about what comes up for you around that fear. Like what's yeah. really the worst case scenario? And I'm not, I'm big into like curiosity. I think that's probably because I've worked with a coach and a therapist over the years. They're like, Liz, get curious about this. I'm like, I like that because I don't mm -hmm. get curious about anything. I just want it solved, you know? So anyway, I would say though, what about fear of failure is comes up for you? Like what about it, uh, you know, what scares you? You know, yeah. what's the worst case scenario? Losing money is not, I'm not scared of that anymore. Do I want to lose money? No. No. Um, <laughs> you know, but I, I don't mean that because I have money. I don't mean it like that either. I don't mean that I don't want, I just flippantly have money and just, I don't care what happens to it. But I, because you've lost money, because we've lost money, I have worked through that fear and I'm going to be disappointed. And it may be my kid's college fund. No, it's not going to be kids, but you know, it could be something important. I know I could figure it out because I have. Mm -hmm. And I know we'll, we'll make it back because we're smarter than, than that. So once you move through the fear, you're going to have a blueprint or an example of it. We've, moved, we've had that happen before. And now I can move through it powerfully. Um, when, you have no, when you haven't moved through something like that, the fear comes up. The fear is real for me in areas I haven't moved through now, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so I know from examples, like my own life, I just have to, I have to take action and I have to move through it. Yeah. Stopping and thinking about it is only going to make me deeper in the fear. I also like to play like like what's the worst what's the worst thing I that love can that game. <laughs> I mean that always helps me. Like I'm just and I do that all the time. We're like, all right, we're going to have investor con, putting a lot of money out for for quite honestly for a large conference. It's going yeah. to help so many women, but we don't know who's going to come, how many people are going to start. You know, <laughs> so what's the worst thing that can happen? And then we talk about numbers. We're like. Oh, that would be really bad, you know. Would that really happen? Then we start to laugh, and it le lightens up the mood, you know. Um, but I also think it's indicative too. You were talking earlier about conservative underwriting and understanding your risk, right? And when someone comes to you and says, "Like this is my last fifty thousand dollars," and you're like, "Yeah, no." If you're playing the worst case scenario game, and the worst case scenario is that like you're homeless on the street, that's not that's not a risk we can take, right? Correct. Like, if I lose this investment, don't make that investment. Correct. Um, and I think it's understanding too, like failure can happen, but what's the extent of that failure? I think you're absolutely right. The, the mitigating the risk is huge. And I think overall women are more conservative in yeah. their risk taking, right? They're going to be more cautious. Um, and and that's why that's why women make such good investors, quite honestly, because when you do pull the trigger, it's usually the right thing. You haven't flippantly said, oh, let's just do this. That's not most women or a lot of women. Um, even if you are an entrepreneur, you still, I know a lot of women entrepreneurs who are still cautious in the sense of they're not, they don't just like jump with not even knowing where the parachute is or anything, you know, so you have a little bit of a plan. Yeah. And so I, I think you're right. I think it is, it, it is part of that. And it's also just trusting yourself. You know, I think that's part of it too. I think we underestimate ourselves a lot. And I think fear of fear of failure, failure is, it's either, what, what the great quote is like failures, of, you can't fail. You can either learn or grow. I forget the, the way it phrased, but I thought that was a, it's a neat way of looking at failure is learning. Mm -hmm. And, and I think honestly, I don't know if a lot of people would endure what we've been through in 16 years. I, 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 I sometimes like, it's a lot of stuff. And I think not giving up and just trying a new way, we just don't give up. That's just yeah. something me and my husband never did. Even when we had no contacts, we had no money, we just didn't give up. And I think oh. that's really important. In uh, Dare to Lead, Brene Brown talks about how if you want to thrive and succeed as an organization, as an individual, you have to be, you have to be willing to fail and you have to fail. Um, and she talks about coaching big organizations and talking to the executive team and the executive team being like, we know, like, we're prepared that we could fail. And she's like, no, 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 no. You need to be prepared that you will fail and that you're going to endure through the failure. Like, not this, like, maybe we will. At some point, something's going to go wrong. It's just how it is. Um, I can also say real quick, too, just made me think about um, a time that I did a triathlon and I had a fear of swimming. And my husband was in the was in the lake. And, and the idea that we 
really should be doing a ton by ourselves. Like mm-hmm. being that like self-reliant, like again, women get things done. Women can like run the world by themselves. There's no <laughs> question. They run their household. They can run the world seriously. However, what limits us is that we are just those solopreneurs mm-hmm. and that we don't lean on other women and other people. Um, my husband being in the kayak, I had this fear over my body. Like I was so scared. I didn't know if I could do it. I'm like swimming in a lake. I mean, you know, it's not, it's a little intense. And I saw him and he was smiling. He didn't know what I was even experiencing because he was so far away. It made the, made me feel okay to get into the water. And I think that's the kind of thing that you want to make sure you have those people that are cheering you on. Not like why invest in real estate? That's a bad idea. Like, you know, they're probably not active real estate investors right now. No. They're, they're not going to say just flippantly buy real estate, but they're not going to say don't do it either. Yeah. So again, watch who you talk to, make sure you have cheerleaders, but don't go it alone. We try to do a lot on our own. So Absolutely. So we have a question here from Mary Chris said, where do I start if I want to do passive investing? Would you say real estate passive investing is less risky than investing in stocks like the Bitcoins I hear so much about? Let's just clarify real quickly right here. Bitcoins are not stocks. Those are not the same investment um, and not the same risk profile. But um, where do you start in passive investing? I want to share a really good uh, book with all of you because I'm just, Bigger Pockets has some phenomenal books of just real teachers. Um, and a gentleman, his name is Brian Burke. He, he's a fellow um, multifamily investor. And he wrote a great book about passive investing. I just want to tell you the name of it just to share as a, a good resource. Um I want to say passive investing. It's, I'm going to just keep, um, uh, I want to share some thoughts with you, but I want to make sure I, uh, I'm pretty sure it's Brian Burke, B R U K E. Um, hands off investor. It's called okay. the hand, yeah, it's called the hands off investor. Anyway, um, it's a great, great resource. I just want to mention that. But yeah, so yes, I, I would say, let me compare passive investing from act to active investing, right? Because yeah. that's a better comparison. I'm not going to be able to go up against all the different asset classes and ways because I, I'm not an expert in all this. <laughs> Chelsea probably <laughs> would speak better about that. I, I do know, I do feel my experience in 16 years, real and working through the last correction in 08, um, we lived through that and that was tough in certain ways, right? Oh, and yeah. then living through COVID and having properties, like I've, you know, we've had properties through a few different circumstances in the last several years in the last decade. I will say, real estate is forgiving because you're, you're not, you're not in and out in a day, right? Yes. It's a, it's a steady process. You're in it for the long term, So it, it is forgiving the sense that it's usually, um, it's hard to lose, but it, it, it is a sense that it's a long-term asset class. Passive and active, I will say on the active side, you are in the driver's seat. You're making the calls in the market, the, you know, the type of property. And, and, and quite honestly, the upside of that is that you're making the calls. So Typically, that's the kind of asset that you will earn all the returns and, and reap all the benefits, if yeah. you will. Mm-hmm. On the passive side, from a risk perspective, if you're if you're vetting the 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 operator, operator, syndicator, I, I'll call it operator because it's per, the person that's literally driving the bus, right? They're yeah. the ones they're driving the deal, they're finding it, they're doing everything. You're literally a partner with them as a limited partner, very simplistic, and um, the risks are that. You don't get your money back, and you don't get the returns uh, that that were you know um, projected. I will no things promised, but projected. I'd say so. Mm-hmm. Those are the risks you're taking in terms of being sued, liable. The tenant falls, and they're like, "I'm going after you. you're limited." You're called a limited partner for that reason. We yeah. we have a lot of past investors. That's how we grew our 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 business. Uh, these are doctors. These are people who do not want to be liable, right? Because they have things that are happening. So. So your 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 risk exposure, I would say, from an active versus passive, is probably lower on the passive. Now you can also argue that your your uh, quote unquote return could be a little less. But again, what are you trading, right? And they're not. It's not. It's it, there's a lot of um, people who don't realize it's not like you know two percent. I mean, you could do well 10, 12, even fifteen yeah. percent uh, as a passive investor. Your what you need to evaluate is the the asset. But you're never going to know it like the operator, but you really need to vet the operator. And, mm-hmm. and there's a, we've done a ton of um, content about that and, and, and certainly happy to give you more resources. But the Hands Off Investor is a great place to start. Great, great guy, Brian Burke, very down to earth, very successful, very real teaching and, you know, no, no BS. So 
Um, so let's talk a little bit about, and this is, Tan has this question about what are some of the more experienced firms on the market? And what I think she might be talking about is crowdfunding type platforms. Mm -hmm. Like, so there's, mm -hmm. there's been this huge growth over the last 10 years of like, start with $500. Yeah. What is your advice on crowdfunding sites? Yeah. You know, I know there's, I, I interviewed a, a woman uh, was doing a really neat crowdfunding in, they're they, they redeploying the money into um, changing, you know, really improving communities. And it was a really mm -hmm. cool model uh, and it was crowdfunding and how people were building their wealth that way. I think there are a lot of good platforms. I think you need to need to vet them as you vet a direct, a direct um, operator. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, pooling, pooling money together to help the masses in, in an asset class like real estate, which sometimes is harder, right? Cause it's, it's a higher dollar, you know, um, reference is there's a great opportunity there. Uh, what's the one, one, a couple of them that I know of, um, uh, not realty mogul that's escaping me. I interviewed her too. Um, but yeah, I think, Rise, there's a yeah, but, but I, I think the key is, um, yeah, I mean, that's one strategy. I just, you want to vet the company and how they do things and how they disclose the numbers. And just like you would, if there's a direct operator, just because they're online and they'd say they do crowdfunding doesn't mean that they're any more legit than a private individual looking to partner with. I think, I think, and honestly, there's a lot more upside potential if you can go directly to, to yeah. you're the lender, you're the one. Now that means there's more responsibility for you to vet, but you know, it's not, it's not rocket science if you do the right due diligence and make sure you're you're vetting people and and you're getting into something that's more you know kind of tried and true. But yeah, there's a lot of great resources out there, and it's cool to get involved in that on a on a level of five hundred dollars or a thousand. One of one of my husband one of the goals my my husband and I have always said is that we do syndicate, and the minimum is usually you know twenty five thousand, fifty thousand. How cool would it be to do something where really the minimum is five hundred, right, a thousand, yeah. and 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 so you know making wealth real for everyone. Just so those are a lot of things we've talked about. There's some, there's some regulations that need to get shifted and changed and just interesting. And I think there's a, I think that's only going to increase. I do yeah. think that, um, you know, make it more real for more people. I think the accredited investor status is such a difficult thing. And obviously we're running out of time here, so we can't get yeah. into it. There, There's reasons it exists, in my opinion, sure. um, to protect people from not losing money they can't afford to lose. Uh, but there is also a limited availability of options. Tom, the one thing I would want to say about crowdfunding sites, Liz, yeah. you have something? No, no, no. Finish your thought. I just want to, yeah. Make sure you're vetting how those processes work. So every one of these sites works a little bit differently. And so some of them are really just posting places for deal opportunities. So there's actually like a lot of different operators on there and the marketplace doesn't take a whole lot of responsibility for vetting those deals. Um, they do like a cursory vet, but, and then some of them are very hands-on where they are, they are also partnering and they want, you know, they want to make sure they have the good deals on there. And so it really depends. Um, and then you want to pay attention to what happens if a deal goes bad. Yeah. And so this is something we've seen happen, uh, unfortunately with one very large crowdfunding platform where it went under, in a lot of these cases, and exactly what Liz is saying with with um, when they're underwriting these deals and they have twenty five to fifty thousand, you own a piece of that, and you're not necessarily you have to chase down that deal on your own. There's a whole different bankruptcy process that goes on versus like stocks that all happens automatically. And there's much clearer process to how that happens. And so you just want to know what is your responsibility and agency if something was, if a deal was not to work out, right. And you were really in a liquidation situation. So, um, oh, yeah, we did miss the seventh roadblock. Well, and I'll just say the real, real quick, um, in, in some of, uh, and you have to do that if you're looking at like, you know, multifamily deals, called, you know, uh, syndications, what is your, um, what will your, what will your cash position be? Is there going to yeah. be a cash call? That's very common, right? So if, if like, the, excuse me, French, the shit hits the fan, you know, and they can go to their limited partners and everyone. And then that's not uncommon, but you need to know that going into it, right? That they're going to come to me, God forbid. So all things you want to be up, you want to know upfront, um, what those responsibilities are. It, God forbid that that does happen. Not yeah. common, but it does happen. The um, seventh, we didn't get to the seventh one. Confidence. Which one was it? Um, confidence, lack of lack confidence. of confidence. I kind of spoke to lack of, I think it was, we didn't speak too heavily on the lack of confidence. Or we kind of, that's a separate one, but I don't know if I tied that in. 
Did we talk about that? I think we talked about it. We kind of talked about it in the fear of failure yeah. and in the self-awareness, right? I think that we just sell ourselves short a lot. Um, I think the lack of confidence, you need to lean on other people who have confidence in that area. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is the quickest way to build your confidence in something is to don't feel like you have to build it alone. Yeah. You know, because you're going to, you're going to second guess buying that first vacation rental or that first rental property. You're that's natural, right? So instead of stopping there, just making sure you run the numbers by someone that's been through it. That's the whole point of maybe someone that's taken a few steps before you and, and you're going to help someone behind you. And there's people who want to do that. Just want to help. That's yeah. the kind of communities we have been both building. Yeah. So fantastic. Jamie, you will be able to watch this again. The replay will be up right after we're finished. But Liz, tell us a little bit more about InvestCon um, in Charlotte. What can people expect? And, you know, who's this really targeted for? Yeah, sure, sure. So so InvestorCon is targeted both for your um, newer newer investors. Um, I would say for the women that, that are going to spend the time, the money, the energy to get there, that investing is something that you're really, you know, you've, you've thought about. It's not like you got nothing else to do June 23rd and 24th. I mean, you can come hang out with us. But, you know, I have to say the women that I know that are going to be there, th these are all women who are, are it's a lot for us to get away as women, especially mm. in person, uh, to get coverage. I know I'm already thinking about my 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 plan while I'm away, and I'm gonna be away five times in the next two months. Five times. So I'm like already like starting Good to luck. feel the mom guilt. I know, but I already have like my plan for every time I'm away because this is just what we do. You know, what can I say? Um, so I think number one, you're definitely gonna get like so you know, and also women who are growing their portfolios. It's like, we all want to keep growing and learning. So women that are experienced, it's also perfect for, um, number one, it's going to be, obviously there's going to be breakouts and women talking about real estate investing specific niches, right? These are real women who are doing these deals right now. We've handpicked everyone. Then there's going to be people talking about business strategies because the whole idea is that you don't like trade your time for money or you're really trying to build something, but not kill yourself in the process. We don't have time for that. I mean, I don't yeah. have time for that, right? Um, so so it's really about like being effective in your business strategies and your business, like treating this as a business, apps, resources. So you can just cut down on the, get just shit, get shortcuts, you know? Mm -hmm. And then the third thing is really about mindset and self-care yeah. because women are at the helm of so much in their life. If we're not taking care of ourselves really emotionally, like we're not going to be good for anyone and we don't have perfect days, but those are our three pillars. So the, the, the breakouts and the, and every speaker is filling one of those three pillars. Um, we have five keynotes. We have a woman, um, we have Kim Kisaki talking about, you know, obviously real estate and financial stuff. We have another woman talking about like how to 10 times your thinking, but also your, you know, where you're at. Um, our other keynotes are going to be touching on like just living life on your own terms and things like that. So it's a really nice mix of like mindset, business, but really at the helm of what we do is investing. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll just say that the goal and the idea is that there's like mindful breaks we've baked in so you can get into like small circles with each other. And, um, you know, our, our beginning exercise, we're going to be really putting women into small groups to connect. You're actually going to get uh, part of some accountability as a follow-up to the conference because, you know, people get excited and, oh my God, this is the best thing. I love everyone. And then like, you know, June 25th comes, you're like, where was I? You know, what did I do? Like, that's a waste of time and money. And mm -hmm. so we really have put some structures in place. So women, I spoke to a woman last week and she said, you know, I still meet with my accountability group from the last summit. She's like, we are good friends and we're all coming to investor con. I'm like, that's nice. awesome. So, you know, so the goal is really to, to transform your thinking, but have you create meaningful relationships with women who are investing today, who are not going to BS you, but are real and are going to tell you what's going on and maybe cut down on all the stuff we have to figure out ourselves. So. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Mamas, I just dropped the link um, in the chat. You can get 10% off your ticket through May 7th with the code MAMAS10. Liz, thank you so much for joining me. This was amazing. Oh my God. Thanks for having me on. I hope it was helpful. And, you know, I, I think with any fear we have, with any roadblock, there's a way. Mm -hmm. So just remember that, you know, and it just takes a little step, it takes a little encouragement. And don't under underestimate yourself. You're amazing. I don't know you, but you're a mama. You're amazing. <laughs> so. Absolutely. So thanks for having me on. I appreciate all the support, Chelsea. Thanks so much, Liz. Absolutely. Mamas, we will add to the description the link to the event, the link to uh, Liz's platform, Real Estate Invest Her, and her membership community, which she said is opening June or July. And good luck. We'll talk to you soon.